also on the floor. Sure. So my problem is I'm running around all over the place. I can't guarantee that I'll be here after sure. 1230. But um, let me um, take a look. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to let my sure boss go. Even, I'm not sure if we're in the storm after this. In the storm. Storm. That's fine. I mean, so I let my boss know about the situation. They told me that you're done after 12.30. So possibly he'll either assign me or my co-worker to come back up here to check on the table and see what's going on. As long as you could remember asking, asking the speakers not to switch the buttons by accident because they're thinking, oh, it's a laptop. Right, right, right. right. It's not an issue. I mean, I'll deal with this as soon as I can. Or have my co-worker deal with it. And I don't want to mess with it right now just to see if the PC's back on once. Right, right. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> that's better. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see if we're in the room in the afternoon. That's I we're in 301. I could check the schedule on my. Uh, so that's not. Uh, that's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> don't bother to worry about it. I appreciate it, though. Yeah, no, I think, I think we're. Uh, we might do that after this anyway. But, um, but yeah, I'm running one of the workshops that's downstairs. That was good. I was just here to get things set up in the morning. Oh, yeah. No worries. Yeah, my boss told me uh, you know, 15 minutes too to come up here and take the, you know. No kind of pain. Yeah. I'm glad I did. Yeah, no, I'm glad. Like, yeah. Well, and the, I don't know if they realize like, when they use this, they messed anything up, but like, not think thing. Like, well, the, you know, they no one's going to say anything. Yeah. So, you know. And, you know, I found one of the wires here, the video wires disconnected. That's how I knew it was a problem. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But when I put it, back in, put it back in and turned everything on, um, there was no video signal. Gotcha. So I just uh, prayed that the laptop connection would work instead. And it did. So. Uh -huh. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for your help. I no, appreciate no it. No problem. If there's any, any other issues, just uh, give us a call. Up. Absolutely.
Uh, I don't know much about okay. Yavi. I know a little bit. Um, we've got a slowly level all set up yeah. for the um, presentation. Uh, uh, what, what question did you have? Well, I was just, since I'm too short to stand behind this podium, and I wanted to make the introductions, I was just trying to figure out if there was a level oh, here's here. Some, here's if you want to put that on. Yeah, yeah that's what I do. Okay. Uh, you know the guy. The only thing that's not dead, I think, is the mic.
welcome to Interprofessional Education Day. This is, from uh, my point of view, as Dean of Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health, an immensely important day uh, to express both our shared commitment to the health of everyone, to raising the floor and the ceiling of health for everyone, our commitment to understand how it gets done, and our commitment to, to understanding how to most effectively work together across our health professions. This morning for this plenary session, uh, I am deeply honored to introduce our speaker, and I know that we will share in the sense that this is both a pleasure and a privilege to hear him. Uh, it's my, my deep honor to introduce somebody who probably doesn't need any introduction, and that is uh, Professor Robert Folwell. Dr. Folwell is the Associate Dean of the Mellon School for Community and Minority Affairs. His work here has centered around two major themes, of course, being a leader and teaching in our Masters of Public Health program and doing public health research and program development in community settings. His published work has examined a wide variety of themes, from health disparities to actually understanding how they've been enacted in terms of mass incarceration, uh, and how mass incarceration and the fact that we drive it affect the health of our public. Since 2010, Dr. Fulwell has been teaching public health courses both in our walls and inside other walls in six uh, New York State prisons that host the Bar Prison Initiative, where he has been teaching public health to people who are incarcerated. And he's been actively working to promote a variety of public health programs that were developed and managed by the Bar Prison Initiative alumni, um, which we are very proud of and, and really honored for. In recognition of Dr. Polo's many areas of leadership for this institution and to propel them even further, he was just named uh, the 2019 Provost Senior Faculty Teaching Scholar, uh, which we're also proud of. And uh, today you are in for a talk and that will be really fabulous, I know, in which he will present a uh, focus on the 400 Years of Inequality Initiative and the way in which this initiative and enhance all of our work that we do to promote health equity and eliminate health disparities. He and I will be leading a session this afternoon in the ITE sessions to build on this and to think across health professions how we tackle, how we understand better and tackle the social determinants of health that will drive health inequities. But, thank you. So, good morning. And I'm, oh. okay. Thank you. I've been lecturing in this building for almost 25 years, and I've always had the sense that my voice carries. Am I correct in assuming that you can hear me? Okay. I didn't see anybody go, huh? So we're good, right? This is a talk that is part of a day that, at least for me, is devoted to the creation of community. In this room, we represent four different schools, all about the ways in which we prepare young professionals like you for emergence and immersion in the worlds of public health, medicine, dentistry, and nursing. And part of what we have always struggled to do, it seems to me, is speak across all the differences that are created by our various specialties. The more specialized you become, the more expert you are in a given situation, the harder it is to talk to other people about what you do, why it's significant, and why it has captured so much of your attention in life. I want to help us think through the issue of communication across communities by focusing, interestingly enough, on history. Now, some of you have taken classes with me, others of you have heard me lecture. And you know that uh, I always say that part of my attention to and fascination with history comes about simply because I'm old. 
As someone who's been teaching here since 1990, I'm often in the classroom making allusion to or pointing to a particular part of my experience or my understanding of history only to suddenly discover that despite the fact that you are amongst the best and brightest students we have in the U.S., many of you have no idea what happened the day before you were born and have no real sense of how history is influencing everything that you're studying and everything that you're about to do. Well, that's the very ambitious goal of the talk I'm about to give. Some of you may have seen, if you are faithful readers of the American Journal of Public Health, this article that was published in January of 2019, just a couple of months ago, authored by, amongst other folks, Tom Leviste, who is currently the Dean of the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine at of all places, Tulane University. I say of all places because I was born in New Orleans. Mindy Fully Love, who is not my cousin, who's not my sister, but who is my ex-wife, which always raises questions, oh, really? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> and then it becomes critically important to understand that the entire impetus for the notion that we as a nation and certainly as a community of folk involved with medicine and public health, should be thinking about 400 years of inequality, literally comes about as a result of her leaving the faculty here at medicine and public health to go to the new school, where in the preparation for an article on serial forced dislocation, she suddenly makes the discovery in talking about what has happened to African Americans, that between 1619, the very first year that Africans show up on our soil, and 2019 suddenly comprises 400 years. And what she found astounding was the fact that even people who are Africanists hadn't made the simple arithmetic summation that said, okay, 1619 to 2019 does not equal 400 years, and what are we doing about it? Maybe as a psychiatrist, graduated from PNS in 78, I think it's fair to say she's the leading African-American social psychiatrist in the U.S. And for her, what's important about anniversaries is that we live them in our bodies and in our souls. Birthdays are significant for us. But many of us have anniversary reactions when we recall the loss, the death, for example, of a loved one. When some important event so marked our spirit that every time the day of that event occurs, Every time we celebrate or recognize its anniversary, we have a visceral reaction. See, suggesting that in the United States, in the body politic, we as a nation will have a visceral reaction to this and to the way in which, for the average American student, this represents a dim, dark element of the past that is rarely discussed rarely acknowledged, rarely analyzed. So does it have significance for us in public health? The article that we wrote in AJPH says, oh yes, it does, because it is the classic reflection of the manner in which the foundation of this country is literally built on cognitive dissonance, the difference between what you see represented here and the fact that so few people know about it. So, the first question is something that is easily answered by looking at a variety of reports that often try to get a sense of what's the level of knowledge and understanding of the average American student. But uh, how about bullet number two? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but do you know the answer to that question? If you don't, why don't you? And if it had been a part of your introduction to American history at whatever age that happened, what image of the United States would you have had if you'd known that? Why don't we look first at uh, the answer to number one. Eight percent of American high school seniors know that slavery was the main cause of the Civil War. How did that happen? Those of you who are from Texas may recall that a couple of years ago, McGraw-Hill was going to produce a textbook for Texas public schools. I see a couple of people nodding. It was going to basically say that slavery was unpaid immigration. 
That's interesting. Unpaid immigration. So what did that look like for the folk who weren't paid but who were immigrated here? And the idea that slavery ended not because of the Emancipation Proclamation, but because of a constitutional amendment, leads us to the question, well, what's in the Constitution in the first place that requires that to end slavery, you have to change the language of what's in the Constitution? Just so you know, the answer to the second question, 12 presidents, there have been 45. That means that more than a quarter of the presidents of the United States, up to and including Ulysses S. Grant, were folks who owned slaves. What does that say about the direction of the country when you study history as the actions of the great men and occasionally the actions of the great women? What does that say about how we formed our notions and our ideas about a democracy if the folks who include, by example, the very first president we had, the guy after whom the bridge down the street was named, was also somebody who not only owned slaves, but owned a lot of slaves. Declaration of Independence. What's the first set of lines? It begins, we the people. We the people. It gives the sense that somehow or other, all of the folk in the 13 colonies, at the moment of the separation from England, had some hand in drafting this document. There's also a sense that these guys, this is the Constitutional Congress, the Constitutional Convention which put together the Constitution of the United States. You also have a sense that these guys represent we the people. Do they? Who's, uh, who's missing? See any women? See any Native Americans? See any folk uh, who are like you? Is this an image that reflects your background, your home, your ancestry? Or is something missing from the 55 men who put this together? I want to suggest that if you understand that these were landholders, slaveholders, bondsmen, men who were concerned not just about the formation of a nation, but the formation of a nation that could promote their class interests, it's not surprising that when you look at how the Constitution was put together, no fewer than three articles deal specifically with the issue of slavery. Now, slavery is not named. But for those of us in public health, this one is critically important because it establishes the basis for the conduct of the census that we do every 10 years. All the epidemiologists in the audience go amen because all of our ways of calculating a whole host of statistics about population health begin on census counts. Well, the census begins here in this document. And notice that what it says there is it's basically all about taxes. Who is going to be taxed and how? Well, let's first off figure out how many folks there are to be taxed. And how shall we count them? Now, as you see there, it's going to be three persons, <coughs> including those bound to service for a term of years, Indians who are to be taxed, Remember that there was a whole Indian nation in the South that was trying to be a part of what we were putting together, and those folks could be taxed. And then the other persons, they're not counted as we the people. They're three-fifths of a person, which means that the way in which we counted the census back then, if you were an epidemiologist, would have some errors associated with it that would have made it difficult to segment the population to look at population health based on all the constituent elements of the U.S. population. But it doesn't end there. The second, second has to do with uh, the control of the slave trade. You now have three-fifths of a person, a whole group of them, who are basically responsible for manufacturing the wealth that would exist in the South. Well, right now, at the point that this was being written, much of that wealth was imported. It was part of the slave trade. 
So Article 1 basically says that the migration and importations of such persons, talking about people of African descent, shall be proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress. We are not going to stop the importation of human beings to work our field, to till our lands. The expression that Mindy came up with that is from one of the great Native American thinkers. Stolen lands worked by stolen hands. And that was going to continue until 1808, when, should it continue, you're going to tax all the resources that you're bringing in at a rate of uh, $10 per person. So what's the value of human life? Well, at least in this, it appears to be the value that is affixed when such persons are imported and become part of the economic structure of what would be the South. This is called the Runaway Slave Act section. This basically establishes the fact that property is property, even if the property is a person. Should that property escape, and it's important to note the use of the verb escape here, it's still property. Even if it exists in a state where holding people bound to service is not legal, it's still property. It has to be returned to its own. The Future of the Slave Act, which would be a major part of much of what happened in the history of this country in the 19th century, has its origin in the Constitution. So the Emancipation Proclamation is signed by Lincoln in 1863. It basically was an executive order. Does that sound familiar? It's an executive order that is designed to deny the Confederate states access to slave labor. If you're in the Confederacy and you're a slave, you don't got to work no more. You free. You can go home. You can join the army. You can do a lot of stuff, up to and including fighting in whatever way you can for your freedom. But right now, as far as the President of the United States is concerned, you're no longer property. But the end of slavery basically comes here. And uh, notice that it has something in a way of an ever so slight footnote. Oh yeah, you're free. Uh, but there will be one exception. And many of you have heard me give talks about the nature of that exception. But what I think is also important is, what about the other amendments? This is the 13th. How many of you could write and tell me what the 14th Amendment is, or what the 15th Amendment is? Because at some levels, they have continuing significance for us as well. We're fighting about this right now, are we not? You show up as a tourist, pregnant, your baby is born here, you know you're from, name the country. Is the baby now a citizen? According to this amendment, yes. But there are folks who are trying to change that, suggesting that even current events are being driven by a part of the history that the average American knows nothing about. This is the amendment that's most important, at least in my life, because this was the start of that element of the civil rights movement in the 1960s that said, we need to shift our focus from protest and think about gaining power through ballot box. Now, I understand the 15th Amendment since 2013 has had some adjustments made. All the states in the South that used to routinely deny access to the polling booth based on race were forced to report after the Civil Rights Act of 1965 to the federal government and the Justice Department every year all the efforts they were making to assure that the language of the 15th Amendment was being upheld. But then the courts decided, okay, it's 2013, that was a long time ago, we don't gotta worry about that no more. So states no longer have to prove that they're doing whatever is necessary to assure equal access to the ballot box. And all the problems you've heard about in the last two elections, where the whole question of who could vote, who had the right to vote, what evidence did you have to show that you were eligible to vote, all basically goes back to the worry that somehow or other, 
this amendment is itself subject to revisitation, subject to amendment. This is what happened after the 13th Amendment. What's the South supposed to do? It's just lost access to millions of workers. Well, interestingly enough, that little footnote at the end, the one that says, uh, you free unless you've committed a crime, meant that in many states of the South, this image is from Mississippi, my dad's home state. There were laws against loitering. There were laws against vagrants. If you were found in a city, not your own, and you had no papers that established that you were there, you were guilty of a crime. And punishment for your crime was, you went back on the chain gang. And the chain gang became one of the ways in which the South had access to slave labor without calling it slave labor. Interesting to sort of see a photo that comes from 1900. This is from Bessemer, Alabama, or at least right outside. This is a chain gang that's about to work the fields. That's today. Not reconstruction, not radical reconstruction. That's today. And as many of you know from the work that I often lecture about, that is what gave rise to this. And this is not a talk about mass incarceration. I just want to sort of point out that I've just shown you from 1619 until literally present day, we are still living with some of the issues created by the foundation of this country and the way in which it was built on a set of principles that were all about protecting the rights and the property of the folk who drafted the Constitution. A group that was not a part of we the people, but a group that was really interested in making sure that their rights and their access to resources, especially human resources, would not be abridged by anything done by the Congress or any legislative body in the United States. This is why I'm so fascinated by how little you all know about history. Now, I'm not somebody who is benighted in some important way. My understanding of history isn't because I have somehow figured out something that you did not. No, let me go back to what I said in the beginning. I'm an old guy. I was born in 1944. I'm 75 years old. That meant that when I was growing up, post-World War II, if you know that World War II was in the era when I was born, there was a real urgency on the part of educators to make sure that my generation did not repeat the mistakes that generated World War I and World War II. A hundred million people died in those wars. And it was real clear we wanted folks to have a sense of history because as Santillana so eloquently has stated, those who do not learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. So we're supposed to learn about this. And the problem has been that anytime you are taught history, somebody has made a choice of the gazillion things that happen in the course of any given day to describe the history that they means that some of that has to be left out and other things are going to have to be privileged. This is what Zinn, who wrote the most important book on American history to me, a people's history of the United States, this is why he said he really wanted to be clear that so much of what you got taught was a kind of history that represented an effort to be objective and to create a kind of illusion about how events in this country were generated. If your version of history was like that of so many other Americans, you learn that great men and great women did stuff. They produced events. They made decisions. You probably learned that World War II was a contest between Joe Stalin, Churchill, Hitler, and our own Frankie Roosevelt. And the idea that there were other folk who were involved, that there was a significant amount of struggle that is literally at the core of just about every event in human history, including those that are happening before your very eyes right now. That is the part that gets lost. An appreciation of history as a living event, which in this struggle was an event that was occasioned by struggle, 
struggle between all the different social classes, all the different racial ethnic groups that exist, we have always been forced to create our own history by struggling to get some version of what's ours. Essentially what you've been taught is that we are a classless society. We the people gives you the sense that we're all in this together. That the Constitution was literally created by having a bunch of town hall meetings where people were proposing to say, hey, the Constitution should say this. The Constitution should say that. If you saw the picture, we the people weren't there. Not only were we the people not there, the notions that somehow it was the struggle of all of the classes, however they're constructed, that literally created what we have today is also lost. And I want to suggest that the difference between thinking that history is done by great people and the notion that history is done by us has everything to do with the role that we as citizens have and those of us who are in medicine, public health, dentistry, and nursing are essentially all about. What is our role in creating the history that we live every day and that will somehow be told to our children and to our grandchildren? What are the voices of struggle that he's talking about here? The idea that history is literally one in which you understand based on just your own family history. How did you get here? What are the things that you know that your parents have never told you about your life, your family, your family's history and time? Have as you've gotten older, you've had your parents suddenly say, oh, you know, we never told you, but the idea that we're gonna wait until you're older so we tell you all the shit that went on, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I'm suggesting that families have struggles. And some of those struggles are not thought to be fit to be told to young people. But that you don't really know everything about how you got here or where you're going until you know what that history is about. Let me suggest that what is true for us as individuals is doubly true for us as a nation, and even truer for those of us who are in these fields. What if the accounting you had in history from an early age was one in which you learned about all the folk who went on strike, learned about all the struggles? You were really clear about the genocide that made it possible for all of us to be here. Stolen lands worked by stolen hands. How many people were here in the indigenous part of the United States, the indigenous element of the United States, at the moment that the pilgrims first arrived, and what portion of that population survives? What happened to the Native American tribes that were right here in New York City? Where did they go? What did they do? What happened to them? Who in this room knows the history of that? Uh, and again, this is not a point of finger or blame, it's just simply to say that think of how much we take for granted. Just by being in a place like this and focusing our attention on what's happening now and thinking fond thoughts about what will happen eventually in the future. It is the notion that we are maybe the first set of generations that is so, so focused on what's happening now and in the future that our failure to understand how much of all of that is generated by what went on before means I believe that we are prone to make an enormous number of errors that would otherwise have been avoided if we simply know more about the origins of so many of the issues, so many of the phenomena that we're in a position to study. I think that one of the best ways you see this is to understand what's happening with global warming. I don't know how many of you uh, get news that comes from Europe, but kids all over the world have been basically saying, hey, you're screwing up the environment, you're ruining our future, you gotta do something about it. <coughs> I think the notion that there are worldwide struggles where people are really focused on this is based in part on the assumption that here in the United States, we're waiting for our leaders to do something about it, because that is what history has taught us to do. 
Yeah, global warming is going to be a real problem. Yeah, I see that, I see that. But, you know, I'm waiting for the president and for the Congress to make a move to change this, to do something important, to make sure that we do have a mature future. Well, I think you see what's wrong with that picture. It leaves out our sense of agency. It leaves out our sense that if we produce the history that generated today, we have to produce and be involved in the future that's going to happen tomorrow. We can't wait for leaders to decide to tell us what to do or to solve our problem. They are our problems, and therefore, we need to be engaged in figuring out what to do next. I'm very clear that if people had a different version of history as part of their conditioning, part of their acculturation, they'd be more likely to be activists. They'd be more likely to become engaged and involved. And part of the reason I'm doing this today, leading off IP by talking about history, is to, is to basically suggest that if we were in to, to embrace it even further, it becomes a tool for organizing communities. I mean, think about it. If you don't know the answers to a lot of the issues that I've raised in the course of this talk thus far, what about the folk we work to? Do they know any more? The answer is probably no. And as a consequence, if they did know that, with the sudden notion that there's something to be learned by looking more deeply in my past generate a sense that we've got to do something now? I'm an old community organizer. That's what I did in the Civil Rights Movement 15 years ago. I believe that you use organizing tools where you find them. And what Mindy Fully Love has done with 400 years of inequality is demonstrate that if you have people think about their histories, part of what they're going to discover is that there's stuff that they are absolutely obligated absolutely committed to becoming, connected to, to affect, to affecting and influence. I love this line, because it's a nice way of thinking about what happens today. As a classroom community, our capacity to generate excitement is deeply affected by our interest in one another. In hearing one another's voices, and recognizing one another's presence. I want to suggest that one of the major problems of living in a highly segregated society is, amongst other things, we don't know each other's stories. <clears throat> we know our story. We know it very well. But the problem is, sometimes our version of history really does conflict with someone else's. And when that conflict arises, you have Charlottesville. And worse than Charlottesville, you have the leader of the nation basically counting on your ignorance of history to say, I saw good people on both sides. I'm suggesting another way of teaching history in the United States would have met that claim with outrage. They would have understood the significance of wanting to tear down a statue of the Confederacy. They would have been really problematically concerned with the presence of folks wearing swastikas and hurling slogans that come straight out of Nazi Germany. But because I've discovered that even the average Columbia student isn't that clear about what World War II was about, oh, we know that Hitler was a bad guy. But everything about his rise to power, everything about the manner in which a democratic form of government was subverted, which ought to be of great relevance to us now, because it's not known, is an active part. Donald Trump, forgive me, <clears throat> is the biggest insult to history that we have in American history. Literally because so much of what he's able to do in speaking to his base is counting on the ignorance of the folk who are in that base to really understand the import of all the messages, all the speeches, all the gestures that he's made from everything relating to immigration, to the rights of members of the LGBTQ community, to women, and certainly the workers. Being unaware of how each of those groups was influenced by history, by being unaware of what the struggles of folk in each of those groups had to do to get to 2019, means that we not only have no sense of connection to what went on in the past, we're unable to see how that understanding gives us something in the way of a blueprint for what we need to do now. 
In her own writing about 400 years of inequality, Mindy has pointed out <clears throat> that the source of the cognitive dissonance that this country suffers from is easily understood. <clears throat> it's the notion that we believe ourselves to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's the notion that we do accept as a fundamental principle of who we are, that we, the people, put this together. It means that we've created that kind of an ecology of inequality. If we could have a constitution that, on the one hand, celebrates the freedoms that all human beings are entitled to, <clears throat> but on the other hand has sections that make it clear slavery is going to be a part of the economic structure of the United States, it hasn't just affected people of African descent. All of the groups were swept under as a result of the inequalities and inequities that exist in our society. They become part of that general picture. And part of that general picture, of course, includes health inequities and health disparities. Conditions that we, in public health at least, with the formation of Healthy People 2020, we say are against the interests that promote the health of the nation. That's a document that says basically we're supposed to be about changing all that. And I'm suggesting that the best way to change it isn't to have experts like us lead the chart. It's to engage the folk who are most affected, to most affected, to be our partners in the struggle to make things better. Our major argument point <clears throat> in all of our efforts in the world of diplomacy are based on the notion that we are the model nation of the entire world. That our form of democracy is a model that should be followed everywhere. And while there is some obvious truth to that, to the degree that it also hides so many realities, especially those having to do with things like infant mortality rates, where we rank lower in the world than Cuba, how do we adjust those two facts and make the claim where all that in a bag of chips. If, in point of fact, the data that so many of us are involved in studying demonstrates otherwise. <clears throat> and I think uh, it's sort of important to point out that even the ways in which we talk about group membership have a certain oddity to them. I told you I was from Louisiana. I was born in the era of one drop. You know, if you had one drop of black blood, you were black. Even if you had blonde hair, blue eyes, the whole deal. <clears throat> well, I, that's an interesting kind of logic because there are a whole bunch of white people who have one drop of us in them. And a lot of them don't know it because what they see in the mirror is not this. But uh, Ancestry.com and a whole bunch of other services have now started to tell Americans, oh, look at your DNA, guess what? Surprise! <laughs> this suggests, as the slide said, that we have more in common than we realize. So what if you're one of those folks who discovers that your DNA is composed something like this? Are you now obligated to learn something about the other histories? The histories of that part of your genetic code that came from someplace else? The history that is belied by what you see in the mirror, but which we're told, based on science, is actually there. And in some ways, when we talk about anniversary reactions, may be kicked into gear when 2019 is ended and the observance of 400 years of inequality will have passed. <clears throat> this is how we ultimately treat it in our field, correct? <clears throat> but don't, don't bother squinting to read this. This is just to point out that uh, Sandro Galea, who was once our chair of epidemiology and who's now the dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University, I'll sort of put all this in perspective by looking at mortality rates in 2000 that are attributable to the following causes. Low education. Those of you who are doing health disparities work and have read the many documents that the CDC has put out know 
<clears throat> and according to them, one of the most dramatic impacts that can be made on health disparities is literally to include the level of education of all Americans. That's not more health care. That's not more access to medication. That's not even more access to all of us. Raise the level of education. You dramatically lay it, raise the possibility of enjoying a much more productive life and health. But how about the notion that almost 200,000 more deaths in 2000 were attributed to the pattern of segregation that exists in our lives? For example, it's not clear to a lot of us how much and to what degree this is true of the city of New York. Some of you may have read about the dissimilarity index. Interesting statistic. It's a way of sort of talking about the distribution of groups, in this case, racial ethnic groups, in the general population. Imagine a city that has 33% black, 33% white, and 33% Hispanic residents. In a fully integrated city, every neighborhood, no matter how you look at it, would have the same composition, 33, 33, 33. The dissimilarity index suggests what happens when that is not the case. And we have to look at the proportion of a given population that has to be moved in order to create a fully integrated community. The black-white dissimilarity index for New York City is 0.86. That means that 86% of all the African Americans in the city would have to be moved someplace else in order to create a fully integrated, diverse New York which is ironic when you consider the fact, as many of you already know, that this is a minority-majority city, where the biggest minority group is white people, 35 percent. And changing under gentrification. But it's one of the ways in which I sort of underscore the degree to which, because of the pattern of residential segregation, we don't know each other. We don't know each other's stories. Most of you probably went to a high school or a college that was structured along lines that meant that diversity as it exists in the United States was not a part of your upbringing, was not a part of your training, was not a part of your education. So learning other people's stories, which is so important for you as a physician or a dentist, what you help me? What have you been exposed to? What do I know about where you live and how that might have impacted what's happening as I do my health care exam to be here right now. And for those of us in public health, is not a notion that one of the things we're supposed to do as a function of our recognition that we have segregated patterns of health care, that life expectancy can vary from one neighborhood to another, that in New York City, as former Commissioner Bassett once said, life expectancy between the poorest and the richest neighborhoods in this town can vary by 11 years? Well, doesn't that mean that we have an obligation to sort of understand how these patterns of segregation are impacting access to health care? Well, clearly they do. But Mindy is fond of pointing out that what this typically means is the way in which we're going to tackle these problems is to go into poor neighborhoods. If yours is a neighborhood that's got a lot of HIV, i got to be there. Your neighborhood is having a problem with uh, opioid. Yeah, had a lot of overdoses. i got to work there in that community. This gives us the sense that we are not one nation, we are many nations, all divided into these communities. And that if you're going to do the work to change what's happening in those communities, you've got to be in those communities. As if they're the ones responsible for the poor health that they endure. As if somehow or other, the factors that are generating all the problems that, they were, that we're there to treat, to study, or to correct, are somehow or other their fault. So much of what happens in medicine is we're about locating the problem in the patient. That's why we do the physical exam. And in the session we're going to do this afternoon, we're going to ask the question, how do you factor in what you know about the patient's neighborhood to give you a sense of what they are capable of, what they're not capable of, and what your job is as the healthcare provider who's going to somehow lead them to where they are to help. This illusion that we are all based in different communities that don't connect to each other and don't talk to each other, is what has made it so difficult for us to have any sustained progress in the United States. 
because we don't know about each other. We don't know how to work together. I had a young man in my office yesterday who was dating someone from another race. They were looking at a photograph, he said, in an art gallery. And their notions about what the significance of the photograph was said so much about their history. They saw two completely different things while looking at the same image. Many of you have probably had that experience already. You've noticed that your reaction to an article is so very different from someone else's, from a different background, from a different state, from a different social class, from a different racial ethnic. Yeah. Segregation causes us to see the world in different ways. And if it causes us to see the world in different ways, doesn't it also impact directly the nature of the science that we put together? I love teaching inmates. I got guys who've been on the inside, as has Professor Hopper, who've been around in the joint for 25, 30 years. They look at the standard readings I give all of you, and they see a very different picture about what's going on. And I keep thinking, man, I can't wait to get these folks into the academy, into the work that we do in medicine and public health, because they have a vision of the nature of the problems and the nature of potential solutions that we are missing because their voices aren't present. Because their voices aren't present. This part of IPE Day is all about the notion of social justice. Now, time basically suggests that social justice cannot be achieved if we don't understand the history of the inequities that were organized, organizing and struggle, struggling to combat. If there's one thing that came from this talk, I want you to go by a people's history of the United States. Because you need to accept the fact, I'm ignorant. Not ignorant, ignorant. And what I don't know, quite possibly, is hurting. What I don't know is quite possibly hurting the nature of the work that I can do, the nature of the contributions I hope to make to this field. What I don't know about my past, I'm hoping you'll agree, has something to do with how you're judging what's going on today. And if it changes how you look at what's going on today, I have every reason to believe it will change in some really important way how you're looking at the future. 400 years of inequality as a movement is currently located at the New School. That's where Mindy Fully Love is. Mindy is a psychiatrist who <clears throat> has as her greatest uh, achievement in life, according to her, the fact that she's a lifetime honorary member of the American Institute of Architects. He, because it's all about the built environment. The factors that created segregation started with redlining in the modern era. And understanding redlining and the manner in which it affects the health of the public here in New York has been something that she's been fascinated by. So she has, as have I to some extent, gone over the United States saying, how are we going to commemorate this monumental event, this period that we hope in October of 2019, will be a national observance of those 400 years of inequality, where we're inviting not just African Americans, but any American who's aware of history and aware of how much we've lost by not knowing it, is able to come together, review the history of your community, of your institution, of your family, to, to determine what are the lessons that can be learned there, and what do they teach me about what I have to do next. A lot of institutions like Columbia are now looking at the fact that in the 19th century, much of what contributed to the wealth of this institution as well as many Ivy League institutions, and hey, why not almost all the institutions on the East Coast, was the degree to which in the 19th century much of what they counted on for support came from slaveholding families. What do you do with that history? What do you do with that history? How does that change your notion about what the institution that you're in should be teaching you about what you need to do to be a success in professional life. 
seems to me these are all the issues that are bound up in asking the question that we're trying to pose today. How do we understand from all the silos that are represented in this room how to speak to one another when the language of our profession, of our specialty, doesn't get in the way? What can we learn from each other? And how much of this learning contributes to the creation of a community, a real community that isn't just the poor school of the medical science campus, but a community of all the allied health professions as they are represented in this room, where all of us have as much as it is possible to get this, one vision about who we are and what we're supposed to be about. Days like this, where we say we're going to suspend class, we're going to find a way to figure out how to talk to each other, really represents for me an idea whose time has come. I'm really glad that you are all here to share it, because let's face it, we got work to do. Thank you. So we have five minutes before we're all supposed to break and you go to your various workshops. Some of this I hope was provocative enough so you might have questions. I mean, this was clearly much more sermon than it was a lecture. And because it's a diverse audience, I didn't do the, you know, taxable visco, you know, peace of all of it. But if we're done, thank you very much. You know where you're supposed to go. Go through there and not through there. See you this afternoon.
Yeah, so, hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation. I'm actually meeting a seminar this afternoon um, about, like, race in this country and, you know, the whole biology versus like, yeah. social aspects and things like that. Um, and I was just curious because I feel like the more I talk, kind of talks like this that I hear, the more I hear about, like, talk to each other, talk to each other, talk to each other. But in today's world, that doesn't happen. So I was just wondering, like, if you know of any organizations or, like, movements that have been successful in trying to bring people together in an authentic way. Yeah, and the problem is they're highly localized. They often are so successful because they take advantage of very concrete, uh, hard to duplicate elements of history where everybody said, hey, we got to do something about this, and they did. Right. So generalizing from them to others turns out to be a problem. Uh, there is, if I can get back on it. I'm going to show you the web page that we okay. use. Look at that. Yeah. You guys are trending. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Okay, cool. So I can go on there and out. Yeah, and I, I just want to show you where. There's mm -hmm. the call and the response. So you have all these observances. And in some instances, they found out that, yes, they are doing this. Um, but, you know, it's not by any stretch of the imagination a nationwide movement. Right. Uh, but community organizers are kind of clear. You don't have to get everybody. Right. No, we'll start where you're at. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Thank you so I, much. I see there's a yeah, lesson that you already learned. Uh, I know, I know. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.